Praise the Lord, church. So glad that everybody is in this place today. Glad to see a couple of uh, smiling faces at the very least. That means you guys should smile, you know. Nice smile, Brother Travis. That's great. That's great. It's nice to see you all here today. Uh, really thankful to have a wonderful church such as yourself. Let's, uh, let's bow our heads and pray, and if we can make our way to our seats, we're going to go ahead and get right into Sunday school. Uh, Lord, we thank you so much for this time we have just to study your word. I pray that you would uh, help us, God, to take these lessons and apply them in our lives and just live in such a way as pleasing to you. We ask you right now, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Brother PJ, if you wouldn't mind, pull up Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And just as a little preliminary, for the past several weeks, we have been talking about a specific subject. Does anybody remember that word? It starts with an R and rhymes with vital? I, I don't know. I need, a, I need a good word for that. But it starts with an R. Anybody remember what the word is? Revival. Thank you. <laughs> Not even been here. <laughs> revival. Does anybody remember what revival is? Revival where there's a lot of people coming to church necessarily? No, that's the result of our revival or a revival of our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a fruit. But revival means I start to get closer to God. And the closer I get to God, the more I start to be like him and act like him and talk like him and think like him. And so as a church, we should be constantly seeking a state of revival. Okay, So there's no one thing that produces revival. Revival. Let's pull up Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. This is the New Testament church experiencing one of the first revivals in their relationship with God. It says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And this is the verse I really want to focus on, this one and the next one. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Daily. A daily revival. These are things that we have to do daily that I'm going to be going over here. So there is no one thing that produces revival in our relationship with Jesus. Engines, worship songs, nuclear power plants, they all have one thing in common, and that is that it takes many things working together to make them work. It's the same principle in the spiritual realm. There is not one single thing that brings about revival, but rather a multitude, a combination, a harmony of things working together. Okay? If we only had one thing, but we lack these other things, I will be off balance. And this lesson, if you need to write something down or put a title up there, is called The Four Legged Stool. I actually have one up here. The four-legged stool, it's a great object lesson, but there are four things we are going to be focusing on here as we uh, study revival. So anyway, together, all of these things will allow us to experience a revived relationship with God. So we're going to go over these four things, okay? Number one is prayer, okay? Prayer. Does anybody have a working definition of prayer they'd like to share with the class? What is prayer? Talking to God. That's, that's pretty, pretty straightforward. I like that. Talking to God. Is, and it, that's true. That's certainly, that's a big part of prayer is talking to God. It's drawing closer to God. Three things that prayer is not, okay? Number one, prayer is not a magical spell. Uh, I'm just uh, wondering about this, but has anybody ever heard of the book uh, Harry Potter? In Harry Potter, you know, you wave a wand and you speak a bunch of words in Latin and then something happens. That's not how prayer works. Prayer is not if I say all the words just right and I stress the vowels here and I say the right religious phrases and God is going to hear me. Praise God. Bless his name. All these different things. No, no. Prayer is not a magical spell. Prayer is also not a Christmas list, you know, where we come to God and we say, hey, my name. Hey, God, this is what I want. This is what I, blah, 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 blah. One, two, three. My name is Jimmy. Gimme, gimme, gimme. 
That is not what prayer is, okay? It is talking to God, but it's not just a Christmas list. And number three, prayer is not a, a genie in the bottle. It's not like I go in there and I start talking to God and, you know, I, I, I do it just right. And all of a sudden he appears and he's like, all right, you get three wishes. That's not how prayer works. All three of these things involve me trying to exert my will on God. When in reality, prayer is where I learn to give up what I want in favor of what he does. Prayer is not where I change God's mind. Prayer is where God changes my heart. There's a story in the Bible about a, a man by the name of Abraham. It's, it's one of my favorite stories. I have a lot of favorite stories, actually. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Abraham, he's on this journey becoming closer to God and walking in the promises of God. And uh, there's this one point where he and his nephew have to separate because there's some strife going on between the two of them. And so his nephew goes down to live at this place called Sodom while Abraham goes and lives in the mountains. And uh, the, the well-watered plains of Sodom seem great. There's all kinds of good stuff going on down there. He's able to feed his flocks. But the problem is Sodom is actually an exceedingly wicked city. And so because Abraham has a relationship with God, one day God actually shows up to Abraham he renews his promise, and then he tells Abraham something rather peculiar. He says, Abraham, I'm about to destroy Sodom. I'm about to rain fire down from heaven on it. Well, a couple questions come up. Number one, why, does, why is God telling Abraham this to begin with? You know, uh, what, what, What's it, what's it going to change? What's it going to do? Well, what it's going to change is it's going to change Abraham. Abraham, he begins to talk to God because something crosses his mind. He's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Lot and his family are still down there in Sodom. They're still down there in that city and God's gonna rain fire down on it. That's not good. And so he goes to God and he says, hold, hold on God, before you destroy the city, if there's 50 righteous people there, just 50, would you spare it? And God's like, you know, for 50, sure, I'll spare it. And then Abraham continues to have this conversation with God where he gradually makes more and more petitions. And, and each time he's like, he's like, God, what if, there's, what if there's 45? What if there's 40? Please don't strike me dead, God, but what if there's 30? What if there's, what if there's 10 righteous people? And each time God says, if there is 10 righteous, if there's 20 righteous, or if there's 30 righteous, I will spare it. The truth of that story is God would have spared it for one because that's who God is. And it's also who Abraham is becoming. See, in this story, it's not a story of how God is petitioning or Abraham is petitioning God to change his mind about Sodom, but rather he's talking to God and he's starting to pray the things that God would pray if God was in Abraham's place, if Abraham had God's heart. And slowly through this ongoing conversation with God, Abraham's character starts to change. And all of a sudden he starts to see the world, God, the way God does. He starts to care. He starts to say, if there was just one righteous person there, God, there's just 10 righteous people there, God, would you spare it? Abraham is becoming like Jesus. And the great thing is, even though his prayers didn't change God's mind and it did change Abraham's heart, it also changed the outcome of Lot's situation because the Bible says that two angels went to Lot and they dragged him out of that place. Prayer has power. Prayer is not where I change God's mind, but it's where God changes my heart and he starts to show me who he really is. In church, we often pray this thing called the Lord's Prayer. Anybody familiar with it? You know, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. See, we, we treat that prayer like it's a formula, and I won't deny, it's, it's not a bad thing to pray, but what we don't understand, it's not so much a formula, but it's an example. Jesus in this prayer is teaching his disciples to give up. Not my will, Lord, but your will. Not my plans, but, 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 but your plans. Not my kingdom, but your kingdom. And in the process of surrender, we start to change. 
There's three areas that prayer changes. Number one, when we pray, our perspective starts to change. So did you know there's like 900 billion stars out there in the galaxy that, that they know about? That's not even counting the, the ones that are beyond our, our range of vision. Billions of, of burning balls of gas out there that are bigger and they're brighter and they are hotter than the sun. And yet our small yellow star is the brightest. Why is that? Waiting for a brave soul. I like, I like people to talk back to me. So, Because it's closer. That's right. Because it's the closest. Church, the closer we get to God, the less we start to see that stuff. And the less that stuff starts to matter. Because the closer I get to God, the more I start to see who he is the more I start to see how wonderful he is and how gracious he is and how righteous he is and how he's always right. He always knows best. He always knows what's on my mind. He always cares. He, he, never, he never backs down. I start to see who God truly is. That's what prayer is. Like Brother Eric said, prayer is just drawing closer to God. It's getting into his presence and, 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 and just beholding his glory. It's what, it's also listening. That's right. It's opening ourselves up to him and what he wants to say. Imagine for a minute you were to go to the ocean once every hundred years. Say you lived a, I don't know, just you live forever from now on, okay? Imagine you were to go to the ocean once every hundred years with a thimble. And every 100 years you'll go to the ocean and you'll take a scoop of that water and you're going to go across the continent, take it to the other ocean, pour it in there. By the time you have emptied the ocean, one second of eternity will have passed. That's crazy to imagine how vast the life after this life is going to be. And yet we get so wrapped up in all of these things that are going on right now. Church, that stuff doesn't matter in the light of eternity. That's why we got to spend time talking and listening to God because he allows us to see things as they truly are. So that's the first thing. Number one, our perspective starts to change. Number two, our desires start to change. This is Psalm 37, verse four. It says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And I remember I used to read that when I was a child and, and I just had a bit of a problem because I had all kinds of desires. Like I wanted, you know, candy on Sunday and I wanted to have my driver's license at the age of eight and I thought it'd be really cool to have a fighter jet and I'd go to God and I'd, I'd pray for these things. God, I need these things. Please give them to me. Da, da, da. And I, I never got them and I, I was just a little, little confused, you know, because I really wanted these things and I wasn't getting them. And it wasn't until later that God revealed to me that you really got to focus on that first part to understand the next part. It says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. What that means is the more I start to time to, I start spending with God, the more my desires start to change. The more what I want starts to change. The more what I hunger for starts to change. I thought I needed that Lamborghini, but now as I spend time with Jesus, I start to see that, you know, that Lamborghini is not going to last me that long. I'll probably get in an accident and it's probably going to make me speed or something. Right, Brother Eric? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, I'm gonna, if I have that thing right there, you know, and I have it for a while, it's going to pass away. It's not going to be there anymore. And it, it, it doesn't really matter. And I start to see the more time I spend with God, that he was what I wanted all along. I don't need those things. I need him. The more time I spend with him, the more I want to spend time with him. That's what that verse means. He starts to change my desires. Not only do our, does our perspective change, our desires change, but our heart starts to change. Prayer makes it so that I am a more loving, kind, truthful, and honest person. Why is that? 
because those are the things that God is. He's pouring himself into me more and more and more and more. And the great thing is I don't have to be perfect to come into his presence. In fact, I can come to him with all kinds of problems and all kinds of issues and all kinds of emotions. And what he'll do is he'll just continue to pour himself into me. And as he's pouring himself into me, that stuff starts to come up and come out. Anybody ever mixed lemonade in this place? Yeah, made lemonade. You know, you got to add the sugar. You got to add the water. You know, what happens if you add too much water? It starts to, it becomes watered down. It starts to taste less like lemonade and more like the water. So the more water you're adding to that lemonade, the less it starts to taste like what it was and the more it starts to taste like what it's going to be. It's the same with God. That's what happens when we come into prayer. God is pouring himself into us. And I guess you could say he's watering down the parts of me that rub people the wrong way. It's grandma's lemonade. That's right. Anybody ever had grandma's lemonade? Grandma Christensen. Often we lack love because we refuse to pray. Can't tell you the times I got in an argument with a sibling. Not my spouse. <laughs> Not my wife. No, of course not. <laughs> you know, and you, you go to God and you're all upset. You're just like, oh, God, they said this and they did this. And I can't believe that they said that thing to me that way. And it just gets under my skin. And, and you know, God's just kind of listening the whole time. And he's, he's nodding his head. And then, you know, every time, you know, you, you just stop, stop to take a breath. He's like, well, you know, you, you said this. And, and, well, you did it that way. And it's like, man, don't tell me that, God. I'm angry. I'm ranting to you, you know? And he's like, okay, okay. And then you get done ranting. And he's like, well, now hold on now. You need to look at things from my perspective. When we start spending time with God, our desires start to change. Our heart starts to change. We become more loving people because God shows us who he truly is and who we truly are and how much we need him. He's pouring himself into me. So that's the first leg, okay? Prayer, four-legged stool. Second leg is fasting. It's like a four-letter word in the church, fasting. Fasting, what it's not. Fasting is not a diet. I know we treat it that way sometimes, right? It's not a diet. It's not a way to show people how spiritual you are. In fact, the Bible teaches that we're not to let people know that we're fasting. It doesn't mean you go to like extreme lengths to, to hide it to the point where you're like, oh, you know, if someone asks you, it's not the end of the world if you, if you share it with them. But what that means is it's not supposed to show how spiritual you are. It's supposed to bring you closer to God. It's not a method of getting attention. Fasting is, is a way to get yourself out of the way. It's abstaining from something pleasurable for a time in order to get closer to God. Instead of staying up till two in the morning watching Netflix, I'm going to take some time and pray. Or maybe instead of uh, eating that meal on my lunch break, I'm going to go take some time and pray. Or instead of uh, flipping through Facebook on my phone for two hours, I'm going to take some time and pray. Fasting is abstaining from something pleasurable for a time in order to get closer to God. And the thing we got to remember about Fasting is that it doesn't do a thing for God, right? Remember, God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Fasting is something I do for me. I, I brought this up here just because I thought it'd be a cool little example. Put this right here. So, You guys see that? Kind of bright, right? Put this over. Yeah, it's kind of. What about that? Much better. Much better. Why is it brighter when I shine it through the cup than the lampshade? Yeah, there's less block in the light. It's the same with God, church. Sometimes we do this thing where we, we allow ourselves to get in the way of the presence and the glory of God. See, the more stuff there is in me, the less of Jesus people are going to be able to see in me. 
But the less of me there is, the more transparent I am with God and the more I empty myself of me, the more people are able to see him. Fasting, it's getting myself out of the way. And it's not enough, church, just to pray if we want revival. If we truly desire to see God do great things in our life, we must learn how to fast. There's this story in the book of Mark about uh, the disciples of Jesus. And the Bible says Jesus has gone up on a mountain somewhere. He's with Peter, James, and John. They're experiencing the presence of God up in that place. And while they're up there, this guy comes along to the disciples. And he's like, hey, you got to help my son. He's possessed by a demon. He's possessed by a demon. That's pretty bad. Now, the disciples up to this point have been casting out demons left and right. And normally, this would not be a problem, except this demon has made the guy mute. Now, you might ask the question, well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, in those days, there was an ancient superstition that if you knew somebody's full name, you had complete control over them. And so what the Jewish exorcists at that time would do is whenever they came across a a demonically possessed person, they would command that demon to tell it its name. They'd say, we want to know your name. And that normally, well, I don't want to say it worked. I don't really know whether or not it worked. I do know by the scriptures that the power of Jesus worked. But what I do know is that it was common knowledge among the Jewish exorcists of that time that a mute demon was one of the hardest to cast out because it wouldn't say its name. It wouldn't even speak. That's why it was so astonishing to the people that Jesus could just cast out demons whatever out talking to them because it showed he had true authority. He didn't even have to ask for their name. He didn't have to have a conversation with them. So anyway, this, this guy comes along, he's got the demon and, and the disciples have been casting out demons left and right, but this one is different. It's a, it's a mute demon. It causes the person to shut up. And so they try to cast him out, but they can't. Why? The reason why is because they thought this demon was stronger than the rest. It wasn't necessarily that it was, but they thought it was based off of this superstition. They lacked the faith to cast it out because they weren't praying and they weren't fasting. See, if they'd been praying and fasting, they'd have spent time in the presence of God. They could have seen, oh, this is just a problem like anything else. This isn't an issue. We can do this just like anything else. But because they lacked faith, because this thing they thought was bigger than all the rest, they weren't able to cast it out. How many times have we done that in, 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 in our life, church? Come across a problem and, oh, this, is, this problem right here, it's too big for God to handle. I'm, I'm not really sure if he can get me through this. I'm not really sure if he's going to be able to get this bill paid. Or I'm not sure if he's going to be able to heal this person. That sickness seems bigger than this issue over here. And I don't know, this problem seems too big for God to handle. That's what happens when we're not praying and fasting. They lacked power because they lacked faith. Because if I pray but never fast, I've never allowed God to remove the parts of me that need removing. And my relationship with God will remain skin deep because he never got me out of the equation. So Jesus comes along and he just tells the demon to go. And they ask How was it he was able to do it? And he says, this kind comes not out, but by prayer and fasting. Because prayer coupled with fasting allows me to have more of God and less of me. It's like this cup again. If I were to fill it up with water, you know. Got a, I got this problem. I don't even know what this would be. But the problem is, because I've got these different things going on in my life, I've got all this stuff. I get less of God than I normally would. I keep less empty myself. And I allow more of God to come in. Pray. 
Prayer coupled with fasting allows me to have more of God and less of me. So the third leg, let's see, is work. Work. The third thing that we got to do to have revival. Some will say work. Now, do you think I mean your, uh, your, your occupation? No, not necessarily. No, no, no. When I say work, I mean what's found in, in, in the book of James. I'm going to go to James chapter 2, verse 14. James says this, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds or works? Can such faith save him? I can say that I love God all I want, but am I actually doing it? And I can say that I love people all I want, but am I actually doing it? Being a Christian is not just about professing faith or saying, well, I'm a Christian whenever the guy comes by to do a survey or when someone asks us about it, but it's about showing people that we love them. It's about doing things for the kingdom of God. It's about acting on my faith in a physical, visible way. There should never be a question that I love people because it should be evident in my actions. People shouldn't have to ask me. People shouldn't have to ask us if we're Christians or not, right? Oftentimes, we struggle to live for God because we refuse to do what we already know to do. You know, my personal testimony, I grew up in church, heard tons of sermons experienced the miraculous all all the time. But I got into high school and there was something that God asked me to do that I I quite honestly didn't want to do. I was dating a girl at the time and and God spoke to me in a clear way. He said, you need to end that relationship. And at the time, you know how it is when you're a teenager, you, you like, uh, you like the attention, you enjoy the, uh, the uh, connection, you, you know, you're, you're, it's all, it's like the best thing in the world, you know? And so giving it up feels like a major, a major thing. And, and so at the time, I said, I don't know about that, God. I, you know, I'll, I'll do it later. And I could tell you from that point on, especially was when I really started to struggle with insecurity. So when I started to struggle with all kinds of problems, I, I, I didn't, I, on the outside, it looked like I was living for God because I still went to church and I still raised my hand. But it was only when I saw other people doing it. And, you know, I clapped, but it was only when I saw other people clapping. It, it wasn't real because every time I came into the house of God, I, I just felt this sense of shame because it was like, man, I was supposed to do this thing. I'm supposed to do this thing. And I still haven't done it. There are probably tons of sermons that would have really ministered to me and I could have really ministered to other people during that time of my life if I had just done what God had said to begin with. But I didn't. And because of that, it caused me to struggle. The good news is when you obey God and when you do what you know to do, God will take you right where you're at and he'll start working with you from then on. You know, because when I moved up here to Mount Airy, I finally did what God told me to do. And praise God, it's one of the reasons why I'm standing here today right here at this podium. If we would just do what we already know to do, God would start to show us more and more of himself. We, we, we can't just talk about doing things for God, church. We, we've got to actually do them. It's not enough to talk about visiting people or reading the Bible or teaching Bible studies or changing bad behaviors. It's not, even, it's not about talking about praying more or fasting more or reading the Bible more. We've got to actually do it. Another point based off of my personal testimony, areas of compromise are sniper points for the enemy. It's kind of like, if we were invaded, if there are places where the United States Army is not allowed to go, if we are invaded in a time of war, then the enemy can set up in those places hideouts and strongholds and areas where he can strike back. Places that the army is not allowed to go are areas where the enemy can hide. And the same principle is true in the spiritual sense. If there's areas in my life that that I'm allowing compromise to be. And I'm not living for God and I'm not allowing him to have control there. The devil can creep on in. And he can wreak havoc in your walk with God. 
there's a spot in my life where I'm rebelling against God, that's the perfect place for the devil to get in and do his work. So that's the third leg. We got to actually do it. We got to do what we're hearing. The fourth leg, fellowship. Okay, Acts chapter 2, verse 42 says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship. What does that word fellowship mean? It means connecting with one another. We, we, as a church, we can't just have this vertical connection with God. We got to have this connection with one another. That's what makes a cross. I can't just come into church, experience the presence of God, and walk out without ever having talked to anybody because often God uses relationships with other people to make me more like him. That goes all kinds of ways. I remember a while back, I was having some trouble with a friend and I went to Pastor Delaney about it to, uh, to complain. I was like, man, Pastor, this guy is just really getting on my nerves, getting under my skin. Da, 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 da. And he said something that stuck with me. He says, use rough people like sandpaper. What does that mean? It means often when I'm struggling with somebody or I'm having a conflict, God can use that situation to reveal an area in my life that needs a little bit of changing. In that instance, I was struggling with pride at the time. You know, I didn't want to admit that I was wrong about something. <laughs> and he kept bringing it up. It wasn't right of him to keep bringing up the thing that I didn't want to talk about. But at the same time, God was using it to show me, hey, this is something in your life that needs to change. We have to connect with one another. Love God and love people. God, God put those two together. Okay, they're, they're, they harmonize. A great measurement of your spirituality is this. How do you treat people? How do you treat the people that don't matter, at least in the context of your life, meaning they don't really affect anything from that point on? Let's say you go to the, uh, you go to the restaurant and you sit down to eat and the waitress, they do an okay job, maybe not the best. Do you treat them the way that you feel like you've been treated or do you treat them the way that Jesus has treated you? Do you leave them a big tip or do you just tip them the bare minimum? How do we treat the people at the, at the cash register in Food Lion? Am I rude to them because I've had a bad day? How do we treat the people that we're coming across in the street? Am I looking around for people that are hurting and in need of God? How do we treat the people that don't matter? How do we treat the people that we don't like? You know, that individual that keeps getting under your skin, they're saying stuff, and maybe they're in the wrong and you're in the right. For your opinion. How do we treat those people that are actively seeking to hurt us? Your enemies. Because you're only as close to God as the degree to which you can love those people. That's what the Bible teaches. The Bible says we are all made in the image of God. Even bad people, even good people. The Bible says it rains on the just and on the unjust. God is kind and God is gracious to those that are messing up and those that are treating him wrong, just like he is to the people that are living for him. Because he loves them and he's constantly reaching out and pulling them to himself. And we're called to be his agents by which he does so. We are called to love people. And not only love people, but gather with people, connect with people. And sometimes that means being vulnerable with people. You have to let the walls down in order to truly connect. See, it's gathering where we get closer to God than we ever could have on our own. In Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35, there's this story about how after Jesus has just risen from the dead, there's two disciples walking to this place called Emos. I don't know who named things in the Bible, but I always had trouble pronouncing them. I think it's Emos. They're walking towards this place called Emos. And uh, as they're walking, the Bible, it gives us a heavenly perspective. It backs up and it shows us that Jesus comes along and starts talking to them. But the thing is, even though they're disciples of Jesus, they don't even know who he is. So they're walking along and they start to tell this guy who's Jesus, but he's like Jesus in disguise. They don't really know it's Jesus. 
And uh, they start to tell him about what happened at, at, um, at Calvary and what happened in Jerusalem. And, and, you know, Jesus starts to tell them about stuff. And, and so they all start to talk about the things of God. And later on, they break bread. And they all of a sudden realize, wait, that's Jesus. And when they do, he vanishes in a moment. They get together and they start talking about Jesus. And when they do, Jesus shows up. And the crazy thing is, they didn't even know he was there until after the fact. That's how it is, church, when we get together with people who are like-minded, who have a like-minded faith. I can't tell you the times where I got together with somebody and we've just been talking about Jesus. And later on, I go back to that conversation and I'm like, oh, wow, man, that was God speaking to me through that person. I remember a while back, I had a friend uh, who was who was um, they were just talking about, man, I just want to know the will of God for my life. I just I just I just wish he would just appear from heaven and just show me my whole life's plan. And, you know, we were talking at the time, and you know, I was just telling him, like, that's, that's not how God works. You know, the Bible says he's a lamp under your feet and a light under your path. He doesn't reveal to you your whole life. He reveals your next step, you know? And they were like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And later on, they came to me, and they were like, man, that was God speaking through you to me. I didn't even know it. But that's how God works. We don't even know at the time that God is using us to speak to people. But that's what happens when we gather together. One of the greatest lies of the world today is that you don't need to go to church to be saved. Church, you need the, <laughs> you need the church to stay safe. The Bible describes us like a, like a flock. You know, predatory animals, you know who they attack? They don't attack the big old group of animals. They don't attack the gigantic herd of buffalo. They don't attack that, that, that wandering group of bison. They go for the loner. They go for the one that's isolated and separated itself from the rest of the people. It's the same with the devil. The Bible says that he is a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. He's looking around for some little bit of isolation, some sort of disunity that's separating me from the people of God. Because he knows if I can get them alone, I can make them mine. They don't go after the larger group. Because the larger group will fight back. We do need the church because the church is what fights back against the enemy. If I'm slipping up, I know Brother Barry, because I'm coming to church, he might recognize that. He's going to start praying for me. He might come to me and be like, hey, Brother Josh, are you okay? Is there anything you need? How can I help you? Or, you know, maybe somebody else is struggling and they come to the front and they pray and other people come around them and they begin to seek God for them. When we come together, church, we can fight back the enemy. We need to go to church. The church is our, it's our mobilizer. The church is our source of strength. It's the place where we get our marching orders. And, and I'll say this, sometimes you're going to experience the presence of God more powerfully in a group of people than you ever will on your own. Now, that doesn't mean you should neglect your relationship with God. Obviously, you're going to have incredibly powerful moments with him alone. But he still commands in Hebrew 10, 25, neglect not the assembling of yourselves together all the more as the day approaches. We need to be in church every chance we get. Why? Because the day's approaching. Jesus is coming back soon. Where do you want to be? The law of averages it states you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Do a quick count in your head. Who are the five people in your life you spend the most time with? That's why it's important, and I'm making a plug as the youth pastor, to make sure your teenagers go to the youth group because they're the average of the five kids they spend the most time with. If they're hanging out there with people in the world that are bad influences, they might be the best kid in the world. But all of a sudden, they're taking their cues from somebody that's out there instead of their cues from somebody that's in here. That's why it's so important to make sure your kids are in Sunday school every Sunday and Wednesday because they're taking their cues from their teachers rather than ungodly influences sometimes in the public school. And my wife, my wife works in the public school, so that's not like a bad thing in itself. But what I'm saying is you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. 
That's why we have to be in church. That's why when there's a Memorial Day picnic, we show up. Because I need the people who are living for God in my life. It's important. Somebody say it's important. Let's all stand. If you can. In conclusion, there's, there's no one thing that brings about revival. We have to have all of these things in harmony and balance. We have to be praying. We have to be fasting. We have to be obeying the word of God or working. We have to be fellowshipping one another. And if we are doing these things consistently, somebody say consistently. In the, in the New Testament church, they were doing it daily. If we're doing it consistently, preferably daily if you can, then we'll see a revival in our relationship with God. Every single day. Let's bow our heads and pray right now. God, I pray that you would help us all to apply these four things to our life. Help us, O oh Lord, every day to come to you in prayer. Help us, Jesus, to have a regular habit of fasting, of abstaining from things so that we can get more of you. Help us, O oh Lord, to obey what your word says instead of just putting it off, O oh Lord. Help us to work, Jesus. Help us, O oh Lord, to fellowship and connect with one another. I pray, Jesus, all these things for every person in here. In Jesus' name, amen. Service starts in about 10 to 15 minutes. Feel free to fellowship, connect with one another, talk with one another, and say hi.